Off Track Podcast, Morning Edition. Look, we've got light outside. Uh, we've got special people, special person with us today. We have the usuals, Deacon and Pizza. They're not so special. But the special person today is Mike T. Schmidt. <laughs> Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, Thank you. for uh, being here. Um, Long time listener, first time caller. Yeah, you're in the you're in the Patreon, right? Yeah. <laughs> Thing. I'm, I'm a subscriber. Dude, you're He's a real stand. one. He's a stan. I love the uh the Tom Lamarsh video. That really made me happy to watch. Yes, dude. That one's coming out probably in like a couple weeks, so no leaks on oh. that yet. Nobody the public doesn't even know that there is a Tom Lamarsh video yet. Oh, oh, shit. I just dropped the D. Damn. It's okay. If you want to watch the Tom Lamarsh video, check out check out our Patreon. Check out our Patreon. Tom Lamarsh that was a mini documentary. Bro, that was the fastest shameless plug we've ever done. I know. I've <laughs> been subscribing for like maybe six months. Oh, the return on my investment, tenfold. Oh, let's go. That's the best endorsement we can get. Uh, oh, yeah. We have Mike Schmidt on the podcast. Mike Schmidt, fixed gear legend. If you know him, you know him. If you don't know him, though, Mike Schmidt, what is your relationship to the fixed gear scene and a little bit of who you are? Oh, um, I like I, I without tooting a little too much of like my own horn. I definitely feel like I help kind of make uh, the scene what it is. I started riding in. 2007 um i was very like active on like online so like on like the trick track message board i uh i designed like a 26 inch fixed gear freestyle frame uh like while i rode for leader in 2009 and i was like all bikes are gonna look like this and everyone told me i was a fucking idiot and <laughs> all bikes now look like that uh first 26 inch fixed freestyle rider uh in the u.s but there was one guy on, in japan who rode 26 inch before me on a star fuckers uh i was i really like kind of uh like led the the nomenclature of FGFS on uh, Check Track. We didn't know what to call it. People were calling it like FGX, like BMX, and uh, people were calling it like uh, seven hundred CMX, seven hundred CMX, and all this just like crazy stuff. And uh, I like talked to a bunch of people. I was like really pushing for FGFS. I thought that just felt like something really ownable. Uh, and then I I met up with Ed Wonka, started the Grime. Um, I've always loved to like start brands and like just make shit. So really, I just started that because I wanted to make like T-shirts, and somehow uh, that led to designing the first production 26-inch freestyle or fixed freestyle bike. Uh, went from welding them in like a basement in Bushwick to full Taiwanese production, and uh, yeah, then kind of uh, transitioned that to turf and. Uh, Operated that it's from like 2013 onwards. It's been on a little hiatus, but maybe we'll talk uh, about some plans for a low key resurgence of that brand. Uh, yeah, maybe in the near future. Turf technically still not defunct yet. Yeah, I pay for the domain, so uh, hell yeah, I think it's just as BRB. If you go to the website, so uh, <laughs> That's so sick. I, nice. I never never fully stepped out. Mike Schmidt, a man of so much fixed gear history. Uh, I think you nailed you nailed it on the head. You didn't toot your own horn. It was only facts. Um, purveyor of the fixed gear freestyle name, 26-inch wheels, modern-day geometry is all of the above. Dude, it's literally such an honor to have you here. I'm such a big fan of you and your work. And, yeah, it's great to have you here, man. Um you started to dig into some stuff that we are going to get into. You just scratched the surface, luckily. I was like, don't, don't go too far. Don't go too far into that. <laughs> but I wanted to start with like your beginnings in fixed gear. 2007, you said you started riding. How did yeah. you find the scene? What was the scene like then? Uh, yeah, give me, give me some of that. Yeah, uh, so I, I like grew up 
pre-2007, I grew up as a rollerblader. I'm rollerblading a lot more now in my, like, mid-30s. But uh, I've, I wanted to start something. And I moved after graduating high school in 2007. I moved down to Orlando, Florida. God knows why. Uh, and I went to start, like, a video magazine action sports based thing uh that like no one ever that never got off the ground uh, how, how actually, old were you here like, uh 18 and so i got like i invested all this money into it but the guy who i was like investing it uh with like he just like robbed the shit out of me and just like kept it all and like spent it all on like pbr <laughs> he like actually threw this huge party and he invited me to it but i didn't realize like all of my investment for the brand to, like went to this like big party and like that's the, that's the brand never started you moved that. you moved out to so florida and instantly got scammed <laughs> exactly so uh and so i was like i need a job uh and at first i like was like i need to get whatever job i can and i like worked at a long john silvers slash kfc <laughs> but as a vegetarian man which was like a very wild ass place to work uh and i upgraded and i got this job at pita pit uh oh and God. they were like look you could work uh behind the counter making these like pita sandwiches or you can deliver pitas but like you gotta have a bike and I was like, oh, shit, like, I don't, I've never really, like, been a bike guy. Like, I've always just, like, rollerbladed around. And I was like, I'll, I'll pick up a bike. So I got some just, like, shitty-ass mountain bike uh, and was having so much fun delivering sandwiches. Uh, and I, there was, like, one dude in Orlando. His name was Michael Blackshaw. He owns Asymmetric uh, Cycling. He's a, he was, like, just this, like, cool nice fucking man who could really he had like a 26 inch aero spoke on a njs uh maybe makino or maybe a samson frame but uh i was like whoa like th this is fucking tight like i was searching on like uh track bike supermarket for stuff and he was like my real inspiration to get into uh riding and i built up like a my first fixed gear uh bike was like built with two 650s like front and back because i was like <laughs> yeah i want to do tricks and i couldn't afford like a, a mix match wheel set so I, uh the very first bike i set up was like dual 650s uh, that was an omen and then that yeah that was a wild uh a wild premonition and then switched to like an aluminum frame a eai uh brass knuckle Damn. <laughs> holy I shit loved, like delivering these sandwiches and was like learning how to I could actually wheelie back then. Like I, I know no one's ever seen me do a wheelie, but like I, I could do it. Uh, but that was also when I rode like a two point five ratio, where like now it's like two point nine to two to three point three. It's like I, I need like a little brolic one. But R roughly, what was your ratio? Um, I think like back then it's like. 46, 17, uh, which Damn. is like that was like the wheelie ratio. I love sure. that ratio. <laughs> candy, candy. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, like the the dude Blackshaw or whatever, he like they were like he did like bike polo. He would like just like fuck around and on like flat ground, and I was like really inspired by that. And I started just like getting into bikes while I was in Florida. I left Florida in 2009 for uh, legal reasons that we won't discuss. And, <laughs> uh, I like moved to Richmond, Virginia, and I was like, "Oh, it's time for me to start like another brand." Like, uh, I just like love to create shit, so I started RVA Fixed, which was like a blog slash like online presence slash like edit like media house type thing. And you, uh, uh, you moved to Richmond because that's where you're from, right? I'm from like two hours outside of Richmond, but I like when I left Florida, I didn't want to go back to like where I grew up in like the burbs of like outside of DC. And it just seemed like, I was like, well, Richmond seems cool. I knew that there was a bike scene there. Uh, there was like a cool punk scene there. And at the time I was into that. So uh, I went up there, but, and started just like posting stuff on trick track for like RVA fixed. And somehow I was like a huge fan of Ed Wonka. Like there's this one edit of him riding the orange gorilla frame with like a song by uh, Matt and Kim that I just like would watch every fucking day. And I was like, I'm going to just hit up this dude and be like, yo, like, you want to ride? And uh, that kind of sparked a whole nother chapter of this story. 
Uh, but yeah, my origins are like Orlando, Florida, <laughs> delivering pita sandwiches so and just needing like a bike to do imagine, a job. Imagine you chose to be high in the counter. Imagine right? you didn't. Imagine you didn't. It's like you know what? I choose the delivering pitas part. Damn, it's like, dude. not only would I not be on this podcast, but this podcast might not even exist. <laughs> <It's> like, definitely <laughs> not. That's great. I do want to say, though, sh- Ace Metric, shout-, shout out that dude, bro. He stays hooking it up to this day still. Like, he, yeah. I, if I need any parts or anything, like, super niche, super weird, he's the dude, and he has it. It's, like, the craziest shit. Yeah, he's a great dude, so shout out to Blackshot. Uh, I don't know if I've, like, I think I've, like, reached out to him and, like, told him at one point. I was like, dude, like, he really... Got me into this, but uh, if he listens to this, hey Michael, uh, thank you. <laughs> shout out, shout out, Ace Metric, shout out, Florida. That's crazy. It butterfly, you oh, choosing yeah. delivery butterfly, butterfly affected yeah. the entire fixed gear freestyle scene. <laughs> so <sick>. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> That's so sick. You said you um, you said you bladed a bit. You should. I want to know about your blading history a little bit. Did how how long did you blade for? Was that your only action sport that you used to used to do? Did you ever skate or anything? I skateboarded when I was like real young, uh, and I would like when I was like a little kid, like maybe like third grade was like into skateboarding. But then I moved to Virginia after living like like in new hampshire as like a very young kid and there was just like some kids who rollerbladed in my like fourth grade class and they had like some like sick like solomon skates and i was like whoa like i gotta like start skating Uh, this just seems mad fun and i was like obsessed with that like to the point where when i was like 15 i convinced my mom to like let me go to detroit to like film for like some like rollerblade videos i like made some like lifelong friends like out of that but i'm like how how did my mom just like send me off to detroit when i'm like this like teenage kid with like no money serious Um, trust yeah for sure but it it like formed it was a formative experience like i was filming stuff i was editing stuff i realized like i just love to um be part of like the subcultures of action sports and I think that, like, really kind of was foundational for what I've done for the majority of my life. Did you did you ever get sponsored or anything for blading? How serious did you take it? Um, I took it serious, but it was, like, I never had, like, a sponsor. I was, like, in videos and stuff. Uh, I, like, had less, like, like profile sections, but, like, I had, like, clips and, like, montage sections of stuff. But, nice. uh, yeah, like there were some hammers that I did, but it never to the point where like I got a uh, large recognition for it. I was a moderator for on this like message board <laughs> for a while too. So like, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's close I, enough. <laughs> yeah. I was like, well, at least I got that. I felt like that was like my accolade. <laughs> it's surprising a little bit because I mean, look, I guess my, my untrained eye for blading, uh, is apparent, but you are you seem to be really good at blades when i see clips and i'm assuming that back then you were maybe even better than you are now yeah i I think i've always like had like a weird approach to tricks uh i mean bikes too but like yeah i I think i can like hold my own like if i play like a game of skate right now like i think i could take kareem right now in a game of skate on a practice trail oh that's a challenge oh yeah Yeah. kareem shahab (laughs) <laughs> friend of the podcast you heard it here we need to see that he did just get his uh baker cyst drained and i never got my baker cyst behind my knee drain so i think before we him and i compete i we gotta you gotta keep it even gotta keep it even but you have yeah. one also like currently oh my god i've had it for like 10 years like what <laughs> yeah is it even gonna be liquid though <laughs> dude it I might be like a, pretty- probably like a fine wine it's like <laughs> <tremendous>. <laughs> You unlock the Baker cyst if you blade and fixed gear. <laughs> yeah. That's... If you destroy your knees, basically, then like the pool of fluid behind your kneecap uh, will <laughs> fill up. Dude, that sucks. What uh, the fuck, dude? When did you... I've been warned. W- why did you start putting down the blades? Like, did fixed gear just in- interest you more? I liked the fact that like fixed gear was like... N- brand fucking new like nobody there was like i had a chance of like 
like doing what all the like rollerbladers I looked up to, like the ones who are like, the OGs who like like created like the foundation of like what tricks were cool and like what parts came out and stuff. I I wanted to do that in something new and so i really fell in love with fixer because it was like it wasn't a thing like there was no scene really when i started or the scene was like very much like a track bike scene and a messenger scene and there was like a couple sprinkled people who were like doing tricks but from the day one like when i started riding fixer i was like oh i want to focus only on tricks like this is there's a whole other world to this that would just like uh, could be like a its own subculture. Nice. So you you saw the potential early on. Yeah, I I just thought it was like a a fun like perfect timing type of situation. That's a that's amazing. Um, Dang, think of how many people's bodies you de- you've destroyed because of that. Oh yeah. my god, the knees. It's like generations. <laughs> generations of crippling pain occurred right. because of one pita sandwich yeah are you <laughs> and that explains the and that explains the design that you made for us it's true it is the, that merch made it to you all right right oh yeah i love it let's go yeah, it looks great yeah they did a, they did a pretty good job despite all the trouble they gave us leading up to it well they were trying to make that knee shirt like four inches skinnier and i'm like no like but as big as I told you to do it, like print it that size. Like, there's a, a design for a reason. Like, a, don't change the file. Yeah, um, fuckers. Uh, I want to let's. Uh, you started. You know, briefly dab talked about the RVA fixed uh, creation. Um, while you were in our uh, Richmond, that's when you were starting to film for bootleg sessions, correct? Yeah. So. Uh, I had done some RVA fix stuff and Bird Phillips reached out to me or maybe I reached out to him. I don't know. Um, but he was like, Hey, do you, like if you want to be in it, like you could submit some clips. And I was like, Oh, I definitely want to be in it. Uh, I was riding for leader at the time. I think I had like the green TRK, which felt cool to like, have a color that no one else had. Um, but yeah, that was uh, my one bar spin clip ever i think like but it's a good bar it's a it's a really floaty bar yeah and i feel like you could be a barsman guy you started to become a barsman guy when you were like towards the end of your 26 inch riding yeah recently I, i'll bar into a grind but i don't know like i i think because ed was so good at bars i was like i need to f- define my riding some other way so once i started riding with wonka it was just like like he's the bar guy so I gotta be like the Smith guy or the Crook guy or whatever the fuck. Like, uh, and so I just wanted to like differentiate myself. He's the bar spin and the double peg guy. You're the Crook and bar spin into feeble guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, how did you how did you get on a leader? Uh, just like I think being really active on trick track. That's all it took. <laughs> I guess, like, I was, like, posting a bunch of shit. I don't even, I don't think I, like, I think they reached out to me and they were, like, do you want one of these bikes at, like, cost? And then I, like, paid cost for one and then they're, then they're, like, okay, now you're on the team. Now you can, like, continue getting bikes. But, like, they needed to, like, secure their investment at first to make sure I was actually going to, like, produce some content. Um, but Sal from Leader at the time... Uh, gave me a chance so shout out to him how many how many leader frames did you have i only remember seeing you on a on the green trk oh the black one was uh before Uh, that oh or or after um matt black i remember seeing a picture of that build yeah that was also one that like we snapped in a video for uh (laughs) when i was like building a gorilla i was like fuck leader and like broke the bike and (laughs) half That was <laughs> probably Asian really Gungan. cool at the time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now I'm just like, wow, like I could have just given that back to an underprivileged person and let them like fall in love with riding bikes. But instead I just destroyed it. <laughs> it's okay. It would have broken on them in about a month. Probably. That's true. <laughs> Those TRKs were, were not the... made of glass. 
Oh my god. Did you break them? Yeah, not to the point that other people broke them. Like I would crack them often, but uh, some people like whole head tube would be it's connected. dismembered. That's crazy. Um, That's crazy. But I think I also just like don't like some people are really, really like when they land, like they're just like slamming their body down, and I feel like I don't break parts like as much as other people because I I don't know if like, I'm just not riding as hard or if I just do different tricks but usually I've I think most people have broken more things uh likewise than I have I want to go back to RV fix a little bit who's part of that crew and what happened to you guys um it was really like myself Julio Betancourt and Brandon Laney and I think that's like that's the crux of it. Uh, there was like other people that were involved, but like not riding as hard. Uh, and I was like all about it. And then once I started grime, I was like, this, this is cooler and this is getting more traction. So I just like stopped making anything for RVA fixed. But I did hold like a, a contest in Richmond. Uh, right after I went to Midwest Mayhem, I was like, oh, I, like I gotta like keep this fucking flame stoked. So. Uh, I like held this like weird jam with that made like this gigantic hubba that was like way too like raw for like what fix gear was at the time but uh, like volume ma- mailed out Congo uh, to come to it <laughs> like Tom and Marsh came and it was cool to like host a like the first time I hosted like a fix gear event it was like moderately successful turnout it yeah didn't um didn't trick track sponsor it too Oh yeah, Phil Rentaluke. Uh, shout out to him. Uh, he's not only sponsored the like event, but he single-handedly made it to where like I like he gave me a camera and like all the RVA fixed videos were filmed on that. Most of the first uh, grime videos were filmed on that. I ha- eventually had to give it back to him because I think he was like selling all his belongings after some like hard times or something and he was like dude you got to give me that video camera back but like he just like saw that i was like doing shit and he's like dude like you got to promote like this riding and he just like handed me a camera so not only did he sponsor the event but he really uh is kind of like a a cornerstone to like why i was able to promote myself as a rider which then kind of snowballed that uh that RVA fix jam had a lot of had a lot of names there. I'm pretty sure like I mean you, as you said Congo was there. Uh Ed was there. Were you friends with Ed by the time he he went out there? Yeah, we had Grime t-shirts. That was like the the wow. launch of the Grime brand, but it was not a bike company at the time. It was like just like a punk t-shirt brand. How did you meet Ed? Was was it did it have to do with Midwest Mayhem? Yeah, I think the it's got it almost, I think it's got to be Midwest Mayhem that is where I met him. So like I drove up from to Milwaukee from Virginia from Richmond and like I went just to film. I actually my hand was like in a cast when I went to Midwest Mayhem and I like saw I was like like oh my god like Ed Monk is fucking here like this is so tight and I like broke the cast. It was like a plaster cast and I was going to take it up. I'm like breaking this thing off so I can compete. I like didn't show up to compete. I brought my bike just like in case and I was like fuck this. Like no one's like pushing it. I was like I'm jumping out of the rafters <laughs> and I like broke my cast off my hand and like climbed up to the rafters. I was like put me in like I'm signing up. Oh my and, god. Like, <laughs> and then I got like I, I got third place or I tied for third. <laughs> What the that's so fuck, metal dude. just, just break it <laughs> yeah. off it like i have like some uh some in like it's fucked me kind of like i've like gotten multiple thumb surgeries uh and like i now have a cadaver ligament so shout out to the guy who died who like donated his body to science what the but, um, it, it fucked up my my hand like not healing and and competing in Midwest may- Mayhem, but <laughs> worth it. But you did a sick acid drop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> worth Not a lot of people on, in Fix here are doing those, but That's that fucked, was maybe the dude. first. So yeah. fucked. I got the I got the results here. You you got third place. You tied for third place with Taylor Dwight. Yeah, Dwight. 
that's so what was that event like because it was a pretty like pinnacle moment in the shift and fix gear uh freestyle i feel like yeah it was uh wild because there was like everyone had these like frankenstein bikes at that time <laughs> like some people were riding these like full-size road bike conversion some people were riding uh like weird like mountain bike parts to make their bike feel more freestyle there was not a lot of uh bikes that were made there were maybe no bikes that were like really made for fgfs there was probably some like a milwaukee bruiser was probably out by then i think uh kilroy the kilroy uh ed was on the kilroy so there was like a couple 700c like beefed up street track bikes but nothing that was like designed solely for tricks so you met ed did you also meet soil there like when did that raw connection start happening oh uh, yeah i met soil and it like we just immediately hit it off there just like such a like person with good energy and they also rollerbladed so there was just like this like cool connection uh and after that uh i started going up to new york like i would take this thing called the chinese bus and it was like uh you you pay like 20 bucks and you get on this bus and they go from like chinatown richmond to chinatown dc to chinatown philly and then to chinatown new york and like sometimes you'd be putting your bike on like the underbelly of the bus and there's just like a like chickens in a fucking cage like and you like, like you hit the chicken with your brain, you know? my bad like um it, and i was just like i went to college uh for like a few months in richmond and i just like completely dropped out to start the grime i was like fuck that like fuck school like this seems way cooler and uh was like just going up and like living at ed's girlfriend's house because ed like just was living with her and so he was like, hey, this guy, Mike's coming up from Virginia. He's going to stay a few weeks and like live on the couch. And she was like, not please, but also <laughs> she was a like, trooper. Like she couldn't really say no, but <laughs> was kind of pissed yeah. about it. Yeah, it, it, there was like, it was a weird uh, vibe, but <laughs> it was nice like that she let me just like kind of come up there and then i ended up like moving in with them for a little bit like they they got a new place and i got like this cool little loft for a while Stick. and then so then grime is already starting at this point um when did you think about making frames and why did you think about making the first production 26 inch frame i just knew that like the bikes were not it at the time like it was just like I knew we were in a growing pain and that we just like had to like something had to be designed specifically for tricks. And I would like talk about it to uh, Joe Krills, who was a messenger in New York city. And he was friends with uh, Lance Mercado who owned something called square built. It's like a uh, small batch uh, frame manufacturing in uh, Bushwick. And so I was like, designing like showing these designs and i like knew nothing about bike geometry design i was like it needs to be like this uh and everyone was like this is the most idiotic thing like don't you realize like everyone's knees who ride this is are going to be destroyed and i was like but look like (laughs) double peg is more important than the knees if you can double peg then like you're gonna be okay and so uh we like made the a couple yomangs and really refined that uh geo over time so crazy so the yomang was negative bb it at the very first one was like perfectly zero but we didn't realize that like the bb shell was higher or like a bigger diameter than a peg was so it still rocked the very first like few ones but the yomang was designed in theory to double peg and after we never like called it like v1 v2 but like on the second version it was fully uh no bb drop yeah just like negative bb and positive bb is a weird thing because like (laughs) if you're thinking about like center of axle like it is positive above that but we say 
negative i don't know yeah, yeah. it's like <laughs> if you're referring to the bottom bracket itself it's actually opposite but if you're yeah. talking about the dropouts then it kind of makes sense mm-hmm. um so i've i've heard that um brad with nempro made the first actual 26 inch frame i want you to talk about that and address that <laughs> That's 100% not true, but he also threatened uh, he threatened me with many lawsuits at the time because I was putting out, uh, I was like telling people like, we're the first ride around uh, fixed gear freestyle company. We are the first 26 inch fixed gear like brand. Like we are the only one that has like a team of people who are actually like fucking doing it. And he was like, he hit me with some like, like dossier of like legal uh, jargon about like how like he was going to press charges and i was like basically told him to suck a dick and like, <laughs> oh, my. I was, like nobody rides your bikes like you're a joke and uh i was like Damn. i was kind of like a young Bro. like dickhead mike, myself at the time mike not only were you the first 26 frame you were the first nem pro hater and i support you fully for that <laughs> yeah so crazy the first the first 26 inch frame the first person to get sued by nem pro what the fuck, dude? That's like a whole can of worms that didn't know existed. That's so yeah. sick. So, he never went through with the lawsuit, but he definitely sent something to like try to like scare us. And I was just like, uh-oh. Whoa, you, that's the type of alarm you are? <laughs> that's crazy. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a get out of bed right now, bro. Alarm. Oh, I should probably turn mine off, too. Mine's, a, mine's enough fucking turn on, too. Let's turn mine. That's, that's a terrifying noise to wake up to. <sighs> dude. Is this the time you normally wake up? Thank you for waking up so early for this Uh morning edition. no no that that's the it's time for you to get out of bed alarm mm. you mm. know i have the wake up alarm and then the get out of bed alarm i would be waking up right now i got double dip on computers real quick uh just make sure <laughs> make sure everything's yeah, don't gravy. Get in trouble with the <laughs> yeah i'm on the clock right now <laughs> make sure there's no fires that you need to put out <laughs> yeah it's nothing we're all good i'm just like <laughs> campaign um, development Grime team, uh, putting together what's basically the Avengers for fixed gear. How did you choose who you chose? Uh, it just like there was no question. It was like it was Ed, uh, Soil or Tori at the time was just in the like we were riding with them, and uh, it was just like this felt like like how a team should be. Like everyone does different tricks. Everyone has rides together. There's like a, it felt like a, like a crew and uh, like Welcome to Grime Street was uh, like maybe at the time, like we considered it like a full length because it was like 10 minutes long. But like maybe that was the longest like fixed freestyle edit um, at that time. And we just like were all, we were riding already together. So it just made sense. It was, there was no like even thought about like who else should be on the team it was just like oh it's us before you before we keep going is was grime named because of the street you guys are on or like what was the what was behind the name grime because i feel like it was so iconic to all of us growing up uh the the real story of it is wild so like i dated this girl named abby klaus and i like called like she would like like jokingly like say stuff that was like grimy and i was like oh like like i like would call i would be like like refer to her middle name as like the grime uh (laughs) but like in an endearing way i was like in love with her at the time and like uh i like really liked that name and then like we like split up and like we were broken up for like a year and a half and when I was going to start a brand, I was like, oh, it's going to be called The Grime. And everyone's like, cool. And uh, I just, like, recycled, like... <laughs> Let's go. Shout like, out to name. Abby, bro. It's crazy. Yeah. So sick. Mike, your entire bro, life is just a yes, butterfly, butterfly effect. effect. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't everybody's? That's uh, so but yeah, crazy. just, like, uh, I at the time, I was, like, into kind of, like, misfits and, like like, punk culture. And it just felt like... A way yeah. to like it was like an edgy word like we were riding on the in the streets of new york and shit and it just felt like i was like oh like this is like there was there was riding coming out in california and it was like 
not dangerous riding or not riding that was like felt like like there was like an attitude to it so like i very much like wanted to create that uh mm. energy in the scene so that was crafted yeah it was uh a lot That's of consideration sick. went into it uh even though if it, it seemed like kind of like somewhat slapped together in the early days it felt very it felt very organic i mean i'm sure it was still but um was there any potential names that you remember like when in, in the workshop was like the grime the immediate no, I one just, i like just i showed i was like these are the designs this is like the logo this is i like just like had it all done uh and everyone's like oh all one right and done the grime yeah. that's sick that's sick so you assumingly lost soil because you didn't go through with a 29er, right? Uh, yeah. Like, they switched to BB-17, um, but also there was, like, we didn't want to make, like, I was just like, the, I don't want to make a 29er frame. Like, I'll make one for you, and you'll learn to ride 26 soon enough and convert <laughs> and they were just like ah this is me and so they kind of uh switched to riding the serpent but even ed didn't want to ride 26 inch when i like first met him and i was like no no no, like you're gonna switch like you're like trust is, yeah like i was like imagine just like the world of possibilities and um then he's he set up some wheels shout out to terry and co uh huge uh like moment for me to like make that connection uh but they would like help us with parts they would like we were on the team or whatever that meant like they would uh help us like build new stuff like we would break stuff all the time and they would like give us free tubes all the time so uh i was like like this is the best room i also single-handedly like I was like MTX 33. I did so much research. I was like, this is the best rim for fixed freestyle. And wow. everyone on like Jack was like, I don't know. Like, it, like the, these Alex rims look better. These like velocity blunts look better. And I was like, fuck that. Like, this is like, I did so much research and I, I told everyone. Wow. Even like, I would like force people, like kids would be like, I'm about to set up this. And I'm like, if you don't set it up with MTX 33, you're going to regret it. And like, <laughs> I didn't get, like, get it paid from some wrangle at Should've. all. I was like such a I I'm pretty sure like I made them uh like a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah, you you single handedly turned that into the standard. Yeah. That's it, crazy. I didn't know that. <laughs> I love learning. Yeah, I was the first like person that. to ride it and then I was like telling John Watson about how good it was and so then he built up like a a seven hundred C version of the uh, MTX Twenty nine or rim or whatever, Dude. but uh, or it was like the thirty three, but like the twenty nine or size, and then people really caught on because like he was uh, kind of the voice of the the scene at the time. We sk I just realized we skipped a little bit of Gorilla Days. Let's, let's touch on that real quick. Um, yeah. How did that connection happen? And then why did you guys all leave Gorilla for? Why did you steal all of the Gorilla people for Grime? Well, like, Ed was, like, he got on Gorilla because he was just, like, a, like a wonder child, and uh, they were like, were, like, flying him out to, like, Italy to, like, meet Choch to, like, to help design the bikes, and they were just, like, feeding him steak dinners and, like, putting out ads of him just, like, eating a steak, which was like, so <laughs> weird. But, uh, like, he basically was, like, like look up. Like, I'm out unless you put on my boy, uh, Tori. And then, like, later he was like, hey, if you don't put on, like, this guy, Mike, like, I'm going to quit. And he just, like, threatened them. Oh, my God. <laughs> he just put his t his friends on the team. Uh, and I was like, oh, my God. Like, this is, like, such a cool moment for me. Uh, the bike cost, like, 800 bucks. And I was like, I can't believe I'm getting this for free. God. And uh, it was great. Like, it was, it felt really cool at the time. But I knew that the geometry was not what it needed to be and so it was very much like a stepping stone until we could create something on our own it's crazy those frames had no well no uh gussets on them yeah but almost no one would like break it at the the head tube junction like the, the it did have internal uh like the the gauge of the tubing got a little thicker 
Um, and so did the grind. Like, we didn't put gussets on the bike. Oh, uh, damn. Did not. Nope. Oh, and the, they, they lasted mostly. <laughs> yeah. I, although here, I never see, I never see Yomangs just like in the wild anymore. Like, ever. I wish. I wish I had a Yomang and a Bone Mang still, like, so badly. Dude, the Bone. What did you do with yours? You got rid of them? Yeah, like, uh, there was a dude named Randy in San Jose who I gave the bone mang to. Um, and then at the time I was just like moving a million miles a minute and I was just like, Oh, we're, we're switching to like the goat. And I just, like, I, I think I gave away every frame. Like I might've, I might've given mine to Combs. Shout out to Anthony Combs. If you're listening to this, uh, hi Combs. <laughs> we love Combs. Combs was love Combs. one of our, he was our, He's been our only in-person podcast guest so far. Oh, love that. Uh, Combs and I are working on a project right now. Sick. Ooh. Um, hold on, hold on. We'll we'll tease that. We'll we'll get into that a, a little later. A L- little bit of turf, a little bit of turf resurgence there. Yeah. Um, a little lower. Speaking of Combs, though, you guys eventually left New York and moved to San Jose. Uh, why? Uh, I'm honest, was the, like, the mecca of fixed gear, and there was cold winters in New York, and I was like, dude, we gotta go to California, like, we gotta ride 365, like, we gotta, like, push the brand, like, we gotta make something out of this, and they were, they had become the U.S. distributor, uh, we had, like, some sort of agreement with them to where, like, we stopped selling from our web shop, and you could only buy our, uh, like bikes from them and so i was like the best way to sell more bikes is to like show up and just ride uh and that's like when the team started getting bigger yeah i feel like that was like a grime v2 yeah there was like the early days like the roots then the san jose days and then there was like the bay area days um and then it kind of transitioned to turf in 2013 How'd you pick who you picked for the team? Because I think personally, it's one of the most iconic teams that has like ever been assembled. It was mostly just like conversations with Ed, like who we thought was like doing something that was cool, but unique to like us. And like, uh, like Combs was being referred to as like reckless at the time. We just like loved that. He was like not only breaking bikes, but like breaking himself off. Uh, and then Devon, Devon always on was like <laughs> just like the smoothest style anyone had ever seen and we just Fuck. knew that oh, it had to be dude. him. He was he uh, both of them dude, relative dude. like pretty undiscovered at the time too. Yeah. yeah. Like see like sleepers. Uh and then Hambone was like I had met Hambone actually in like he, he, there, I I also like there was like a Washington DC uh, competition that I won. I don't know if that's in the Fixie archives. Um, I did a double peg up a rail to bar out. Like this was like, it's gotta be like 2011 or 2012. But um, like Hamrick from Kansas city drove all the way out there for like this, like maybe Holdfast was like the main sponsor for it. But uh, it was the fixed tricks, the fixed tricks jam. Yep, so it is in the archives, the fucking single source of truth. I got but, you. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like I met Hamrick through that, and at the time I was like, his riding is cool, but uh, he was like still very much like learning his way. Uh, and then like when we got out to California, he hit me up and was like, dude, I want to like come out and ride. And I was like, okay, like, do you want to get an apartment or like together? And he was like, okay. Uh, so we just we had what was called like the trap house and uh it was like kind of like flop house type thing like people came people went uh we were like delinquents and like just like playing uh like vietnamese poker all day and like let's go drinking ancient age whiskey <laughs> um making a lot of like weed butter and shit and uh yeah like it was like iconic i just like, I just, like was like Ham- hammerick you're cool i didn't really know if his riding was like gonna like get to a place uh and then once he like got a place together he was like i'm gonna start like putting in work and he did he was like doing tooths not hangers but like tooths uh down like 
nine stair rails when nobody had ever, besides Ed, had ever done like a front peg grind down a rail. So um, yeah, he definitely stepped up. And so I was like, we got to put him on too. We've all seen the consequences of him doing that trick. <sighs> yeah, well, you can't. Yeah, his, he definitely broke like four, five, six, seven bones in his face. Like, uh, <sighs> It's still maybe different fractures of one bone. I don't really know how many face bones you got, but the, it was multiple fractures. That might be one of still one of the worst fixed gear falls. Also, the way it's edited is sick. Where like the picture cuts out and he goes, "I can't see." Dude. Yeah, and you're just like, you're, you're. We're just kind of left to. It's left to our imagination a little bit. Yeah. Uh, and then you had Ricardo Lino. <laughs> Yeah, that was such a strange addition, but I just loved that he was doing something different. He's also a legend in rollerblading. Like he, uh, like been doing it for so long, and uh, I don't really know how the connection was made, but I just was like, let's. We started selling internationally, and I was like, let's get someone on the team who's just like doesn't live at the trap house, and like who's just like. A, completely separate uh like entity yeah that's true because it was it did seem to all be like the grime team was just this group of people that is in your kind of uh area Um, yeah it wasn't like a team like where it's like we were always like spread out it was like really just like who we were riding with and like the people that we felt like we would want to ride with the most became the team um but then lino was just like a a weird anomaly where he was doing cool things and we just were like well like let's give this dude a chance yeah and you guys were um you guys were putting out so many so many web edits at the time too oh yeah like uh like cunningham skate park and yeah. like uh like we would like throw little jams in the park and like stone gate skate park the one day one spot series love, oh yeah love that shit all alive again and able being able to watch again because of Mostly. the fixed gear archive that, i think there are some that are lost still but uh i don't know yeah there's still a few that are missing but we got a lot of them back yeah oh yeah it's it's been so crazy just to be able to rewatch all those videos that like you know we would loop them forever yep and we would quote everything yep. and it's just like it's so cool that it's all back now. iconic and, yeah, and I just loved, like, the whole thing. Like, I loved, like, branding the edit. I loved, like, picking the music. I loved, like, actually editing it. And, like, uh, I tried to, like, put in a lot of, like, B-roll and, like, personality into it. I felt like everyone else was, like, not showing, like, the lifestyle of the scene. And so it was, like, really important for me to, like, like make something that people were, like, whoa, like, these people are, like, living this. It's not just, like, they're not just, like, going out to film something. Like, this is, like... Like they eat, sleep, breathe this, and that translated because that's how they that's how they felt. Um, so what what roles were you kind of executing with uh with Grime? I assume like filmer, editor, designer. Yeah, uh, basically the whole creative department, like creative direction, and all the way down to executional um, tasks. And then Ed was like the figurehead, and he made some small decisions like had to be summer squash yellow for the bike we didn't call it summer squash yellow but that was his favorite color to like uh like paint graffiti with and okay uh so like ed really was like pretty hands off like he just like was just wanted to ride and wanted to like make shit and be filmed and so i was doing like most of the legwork but i was not logistically doing much and so we needed joe krills to like help fulfill the orders, help figure out, like, how do we get something produced in Taiwan and have it, like, come here uh, to the U.S. and, like, be delivered from a fucking crate and shit. So, uh, so it was, like... What you're saying is like was Ed was a meat puppet. Ed was, like, like the pro rider, the, uh, like, our poster child, but... Mm-hmm. Uh, like he was more he just more so wanted to be the best rider and so that i was like that's that's your job then like that's your role and yeah he got it 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 never yeah it never would have like been anything if he wasn't risking his life doing 
crazy tricks. I feel like the one person you never successfully got on the team was Matt Reyes. I feel like he was always like, "Is he on the? Is he on the team? Is he, is he talking to them?" Yeah. Like all the Shredwell two clips. He's always hanging out, but he's yeah. not. He's not writing a. He's not writing a grind frame. Yeah. Yeah, he was just like really close with Specialized at the time, and uh, once I switched to Turf, uh, he then was like, "Okay, I'm down," because we weren't making frames anymore, and he, it was like becoming like more of like a boutique parts brand, and so then he was down and so i was like all right you're getting a signature part but he did ride a goat in treadwell too yeah there were some times where he was riding a goat um i think we gave him one and he like rode it for a little bit and then like i don't know what happened to that but um he he, he crushed it on it yeah he, he did some he did some good stuff life. So did so did uh, Tom Marsh, his big 360 at Midwest Mayhem. That was on the goat. That was on Ed's bike. Yeah, crazy how he how he messed up the first two tries on the P fix, but then nailed the third one on the goat. Because the geometry. <laughs> um, let's talk about your. It was Gabe Alcantara on the Grime team, and he was like 15 when he was on the team. And there's a clip of him rolling in on a bank to. It has to be 10 foot roof drop to just mulch and uh he didn't do much but he did that and that was one of the we fucked up the filming oh like, dude your angle was so bad on that clip it was so punched in but it was like so sick like it, it was it's one of the craziest tricks anyone's done wow because i i know exactly what clip you're talking about and the angle didn't make it look that crazy it looked cool but that's unfortunate it was. It had to have been like a steep bank to eight or nine feet straight drop to just mulch. Let's talk about your your uh, riding a little bit. Uh, take like a little step back, like like a uh, MTS just, fall off. Oh, what, what, what were you gonna say, pizza? If we're, if we're talking about his riding, I was gonna say, how does one monster truck everything? How does Mike monster truck happen? Because I know from your riding, we all know. You don't give a fuck about your footing. You kind of just get on there and do the thing. H how? I, how? I don't like the look of pedal setting. So I'm got like, it. I'll just, like, <laughs> you got to pray to play, baby. Like, I <laughs> just like, yeah. um, and yeah, the fall off, like, I had already started feeling like I was falling off. Like, I literally oh, shit. I, I came out in the fall. Uh, and so it was like kind of like tongue in cheek, but I was like, fuck, like, people think. Like people are like talking shit like about like me because they're like all you do is like make the edits but you're not actually like riding and people were um, saying was, like, that for real <laughs> yeah there was like some beef with like matt spencer at that time um, <laughs> oh and, <laughs> like i was like fuck like oh. i gotta like act like i'm like retired like this is oh. my retirement edit but it was really like my first like main edit so it was like kind of uh me like joking at the scene of like i've already like fallen off but uh that was like a that's a great video um, thank you Dude, that's that. one of my that's one of the things that we recovered from the vimeo deletion that like that was the number one for me i need mike schmidt fall off mm -hmm. mts fall thank off uh, there's so many sponsors <laughs> in the beginning of that like, yeah I, you had burn I was like, yeah I, I was getting like helmets from burn but i wouldn't wear them but they would send them to me and then i would just sell them <laughs> that's that's really <laughs> funny so, so funny <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I'll give you the logo since you've clearly invested some money, but um, yeah, I never wore it. Were they giving you the the brim helmets? They gave me like like six different helmets. Oh my gosh, I'm, I'm looking back. But at that's all those. because a guy named Squid, a messenger, rode for Burn, and so he put me on. Who? I'm looking back at all those uh, sponsors you did have. You were actually on Saudi at the time. But who's oh, Chari yeah. and who's Chari and Co? Sherry and Co. We just talked what? about this. Oh, sorry. What? Was like pause. My guy. I don't know uh, that, but I don't know. Oh my god, they were it was like a shop, but they also made like the coolest products. Like they would they they made like G Shock watches, like Chari and Co. G Shock collab. Um it was like these two Japanese dudes who started it and uh it was like a New York City brand, but then they would like also sell a bunch of stuff in Japan as like a new york brand but for the most part it was just like a bike shop it was one of the first like track specific bike shops uh like ever like i think it was like 2006 is when they came out 
Dude. You really did have so many sponsors at that. Your <laughs> your very first web edit solo one is unfortunately disappeared from existence. It's your raw welcome. <laughs> Oh my god, I wish I still had that one. It's because I use a Beatles song and like they uh, like wh- 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 whoever owns that shit, like Michael Jackson I think owns all the rights to that and so he like took it down. Michael Jackson actually took it down himself. <laughs> yeah. He's like <laughs> and just deleted it. <laughs> that sucks. Yeah, I'm real sad about that one. That's like oh. still on my hit list of videos to recover. If you're listening to this and you have Mike Schmidt, welcome to Raw on a hard drive somewhere. Hit, there is an insane up. pedal feeble. I'll like, uh, I'll get it real quick. Oh, is there a picture? Yeah. So I got the cover. Oh, Damn. on the fence. Damn. <laughs> yeah, but there is this insane sequence that I did in that Raw edit. I don't know how like good you can see this, but like. Oh, I do huge. just the top of it where there's a 40 foot drop and then I land on the middle and then just bash down the stairs. <laughs> but like, I could have died. Like it was it, probably a 40 foot drop on the other side My of the ledge. Gosh. And I was like, oh. I want to pedal feeble this. And everyone's like, don't do it. Like this is, don't do it. Uh, so Soil at the time was like, I will film it, but I don't want you to do this. And I was like, <laughs> I'm doing it. Uh, <laughs> Is what's the most dangerous trick you think you've ever done or tried? That one? Uh, maybe that. Damn. That was early like, too. Yeah. I have I have a question since we're on the topic of grime. And there was and I know I'm going to get shit for this because I know it's it's coming up. The grime was also associated with one part, the gum wall tires. Specialized gum wall uh, tires. Peanut butter sand walls. And so you, no, I feel good. like I feel like you guys were like the start of gum coming into FGFS, right? What made it that? What that tire? That one specific specialized tire that had like the tread on the outside as well. What made it that tire be the one that's like, yeah, everyone should ride this as a front tire only? Is, well, that was the one. We, we couldn't fit like a two, oh two, really three in the back at for bikes at that time and uh we were just blowing out sidewalls like riding like power blocks and stuff like mm-hmm. that and mm-hmm. uh riding like the uh, kenda tires and um we were just like fuck like we need something where the tread is like a bmx bike yeah and the we found that the the rubber compound because they had a dual compound for like the brown sidewall mm-hmm. it was actually like harder than the full black one and so we were like like this is it like this yeah. uh this tire's never gonna blow out like you could double peg a crust crustiest ledge <clears throat> and uh like it would just hold up Damn. that's that's the tire here. mission and then Fill up this water cup up here. yeah go ahead like in some capacity i'm in like every one of these so Whoa. i'll send you uh like we had like the cover dude that's on one of my that's one of my like that's one of my collector pieces. I need that one. I got two, so maybe I'll maybe I'll let oh, you know. Shit. <laughs> Yo. You know what's funny? I bought I bought an entire bin full of loop magazines off some guy on Craigslist, just hoping that that would that one would be in it, and it was not. Yeah, uh, I can get you. I can get you one. That's so sick. But what I'll do is like I can also shoot a bunch of photos of like all the weird archival shit in here i don't know if like there's a if you want to like put a picture over the video yeah or whatever. that'd be great and also just to have um the iphone's pdf scanning is pretty damn good these days right yeah so i'll go through like there's fix mag there's urban fellow loop loop <sighs> loop, loop, loop loop ollie the uh the print era was so good it was sick like i love tangible media i love just like something that you can hold is so cool we should make a mag yeah a, a, like an annual fast pace hmm? scene i remember that i had a i don't have that mag but i have a profile i had a whole uh little like interview in face mag damn that's rare 
Dang, we need to. We need to. This is this is the one area of archiving that I am very not um, brushed up on is magazines. I don't have. I have like. I have a little bit, not much at all. Um, <sighs> yeah, right. it's like it's hard because like it, they're not backed up. Those and are, that was like early internet days too. Those are the hardest. Yeah, that's the hardest archival pieces to either collect or document. So. Someday, Mike. Can you see these questions? Or have, do you know I've, the questions that he's asking? No? I, I haven't sent anything to him. Okay, I'm, I have no clue what we're talking. Okay, about. Okay, okay. <laughs> I have. I, I see one on there, and I don't know how that one's gonna come into play. But I, I think Jason asked it right now. This is the best time for it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. We're, I'm pretty sure we're gonna talk about it. Uh, Can't fool the youth. Two Seattle trip. You pissed in JD's mouth. Talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, at the time, like. I was hanging out with Ed, which uh, inadvertently meant I was occasionally eating painkillers and uh, not necessarily proud of that era of my life uh, in that sense. But I, everyone like shoplifted a bunch of beer and burgers and like <laughs> and had this like big barbecue. But I've been vegetarian for like 22 years, 23 years. And so I was like, fuck, like, I guess I'll just like eat this like bun and uh, like lettuce slice. <laughs> And so I was drinking. I had only eaten a bun. I would like had a road all day. I had broke myself off on something. So like Ed was like, here's some like he was like my doctor feel good. He was the medicine man, the name of the bar. Oh. Because we were fucking he just like had these like plugs to get uh like like Percocets basically. That's crazy. And um basically like it like I like blacked out and I I thought I walked to the bathroom, but I walked to everyone's shoes. And uh, I was just peeing on everyone's shoes, uh, <laughs> thinking like just that, that I was. That was the, in the bathroom. <laughs> and someone like said like Mike, and I turned around <sighs> with like my dick in my hand, and it just so happened that JD was like asleep with his jaw open, and like the stream just like went into his mouth. So I had to buy him Denny's breakfast the next day because that was like all I could have uh, offered. As, like, <laughs> oh uh, my no. god, dude. <laughs> the famous, uh, you bought me $4 breakfast at Denny's line. Oh yeah, my. Like grand slam, I think. <laughs> oh my, dude, that's so crazy. Oh, yeah, no. grand slam, $4 back in the day. Yeah. Oh, that's the real thing. A funny thing too is like, I, like he got up out of the chair and immediately ran to wash his mouth out. And in my like blacked out uh, stupor, I just like took his spot and fell asleep where he was sleeping. And like uh, he came out and he's like, "What the fuck?" He also took my like my bed and he tried to wake me up and I just like didn't wake up. We're just as straight as yeah, dominance you were, with that. It sounded like you were not there. Yeah, I was gone for sure. How was that? Holy how was that trip as a whole? That's a pretty iconic trip. It was tight. It was so cool. Um, like. We just like got the chrome van. They were like, "Yeah, sure, you could just take this bread truck that we converted." <laughs> uh, and we were just like, we drove it all the way up to Seattle. Uh, like Ed was singing like Adele in the car the whole time, and we were all like, "We're gonna fucking like kill this guy." Uh, but like, uh, yeah, it was just like a wild time. Like it, it felt so cool to just be like, "Oh, they, this is like a tour." Like we're like on on tour right now, and. Um, I think Zane did some cool things for the scene. So shout out to Zane for the Can't Fool the Youth. Good series. Yeah. Um, you And it wasn't even just the grind people on that trip. You had Steven Jensen, Jacob Santos, Santos. Matt Reyes. Such a killer yeah, squad. It was, like a, it was a cool squad. Yeah. Like, uh, we knew Zane wanted to film and he wanted to go up to see Steven. And we were like, okay, like we can like, we can get this truck from Ed's sponsor, Chrome, and like if everyone can get to the bay, like we can then take it up there. And we also use that for Red Wall too. We drove down to LA with that van. It's so crazy how much of all of this was happening with no money going anywhere. Uh it was insane. Like when I, I there was like this one trip I took uh that was like uh Lisbon, Paris, Bangkok, Nagoya, and Tokyo. And I left on that trip with like 60 bucks. And I came back on that trip with like 200 bucks. Let's go. So, like, Profit. I was gone for four weeks and like just like That's somehow so just survived. Yeah. You entered a, on that trip, uh, assumingly on that same trip, you entered a Japanese competition. Is that right? 
Yeah, uh, but I was like recovering. I like died actually in Japan on like the first day. Um, I didn't realize I had a like a severe allergy to buckwheat, and so like uh, only myself and Krills went to Japan because Ed's girlfriend was like. Fukushima uh, power plant just exploded. Like you're going to get cancer if you go to Japan, and I was like, all of these Japanese people are going to live there their whole lives, and I'm just going to be there for like ten days. I was like, I can be around some radiation. Like, <laughs> it's it's going to be fine. <laughs> and so it was just myself and uh, Krills. But like Ed's job was to show up to these competitions and and win. And so I was like, fuck. Like I now have to ride. But my first day, uh, sidecar, the uh, people who are Japanese distribution, they were like, oh, we want to take you out for dinner. Uh, and I was like, can we do something that's like authentic, something that's Japanese? And uh, he, he went to this like soba noodle house and I had no clue that I was allergic to buckwheat, which is like the main ingredient of a soba noodle. And I was telling him, I was like, oh, man, like my mouth is a little itchy. And oh, he was no. like, we'll chew ginseng gum after the meal. And so I was like, whoa, like Japan is crazy. Like you, there's sensations when you eat food that are so different. Than you thought that US. was normal. Oh, no. Meanwhile, I'm going into like anaphylactic shock. And uh, I <laughs> got like. What the fuck? I, I like, you're supposed to slurp so soba noodles too. Like you're not supposed to chew it. So I start throwing up and it's like when a magician is just pulling out this bar. <laughs> I'm like just pulling out noodles that just can't stop coming out of my mouth. And I like basically collapsed and woke up getting shot up with uh, epinephrine, so pure adrenaline in a Japanese hospital. They had they couldn't figure out like what was wrong with me, and then it was like closed for visiting hours. So I was just like juiced up on some fucking epinephrine, uh, and just like in this Japanese hospital, no one spoke English. There was no translator at the time, and so I just kept on pushing like the call nurse button to like see if I could like flirt with this nurse because. <laughs> Uh, but with like full, no, neither of us spoke each other's language. Um, and so then like the rest of my uh, trip in Japan, like they would like say my name and then immediately say like buckwheat allergy. Uh, <laughs> and I would just be like, what? like that's like, like they like that, like became part of a, uh, they would call me Michael Schmito. And then they would say like buckwheat allergy. Like, okay, like that's me now. It became Fire. your official title. Yeah. That's damn dude uh i'm trying it's hard to it's hard to think back about timelines for this i i assume that was before shredwell 2 filming all of this because i don't yeah. think you were guys were on yellow grimes anymore for shredwell 2 it's hard to remember yeah, i think you're right you're right uh because we did like there was two different bike checks that came out that jow filmed uh, in Thailand, and that's where the whole you know is good uh, peanut butter sidewalls. Uh. Specialized tire, the rhythm. It's got tread wrapping all the way around with the peanut butter side. You know it's good. Bit is from, and then Ed had a bike check that was like Star Wars theme. Yeah, I remember it was that. like the Imperial March or something. Yo, I like, remember that. Yeah, so random. <laughs> yeah, that was before uh, Jow was like Jow. Yeah, nobody knew who he was. He was just this dude uh, that like rode for Sadio, but. Uh, like n nobody really knew who he was because he hadn't come out for riding style yet. And then he blew up off a, a 30 second clip yeah. doing ice bar and a nosy. Like, uh, wasn't that right? Ice 180. No. Ice 180. Yeah. He was like the first one. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Yeah. And then all also, of a sudden... he, I don't know who's got the best nose manuals, but I, it, maybe it, it could be Valentine, but I, I probably it was Joe. Elliot, dude. Oh, Elliot's nose manuals are really good too. Miguel. Well, it, these are different eras, you know? Yeah. Oh, okay. Eras. Yeah, okay. Miguel's, Sorry. Miguel's just like too good. It's like, uh, it's like just like in, intimidating to like watch Miguel ride because it's like, well, uh, <laughs> you just feel bad. You're like, this yeah, is, this definitely. is perfection. This is, this is the pinnacle. And that's, that's ridiculous. I feel like sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like sometimes I see people riding and I'm like, oh, I'm hyped to ride. And then sometimes I'm like, oh, I'm going to like just like put my feet up and <laughs> watch this. And I have no desire to ride. And like uh, Miguel is a put your feet up and no ride rider to yeah, watch. Like I don't I don't get juice to ride. I just like get juice to watch it and just be like a spectator for Miguel. Yeah. Jow and uh, Jow and do both kind of came up together with similar tricks. They were both doing uh, progressive nose manuals. Ice picks, uh, 
tail whips they kind of 180 but like or like nose press 180 yeah like is that you'd have to like jump up to i used to call that the jow like a in like a hard nose press 180 to half cap bar that was the jow yeah insane he would do it on like the edge of the ledge too yeah that was that was sick um you and uh and then you you rode for sadio at this time i assume uh was Ryan for Sadio cool? How'd that connection get made? Did you get paid? Like, what was that like? Yeah, we. Uh, I had monthly paycheck. Uh, we oh. also were the U.S. distributor, so like we had a we had a brick and mortar in New York for a little bit uh, on like one nine one Henry Street, uh, and there's like a there's like an old article on like a probably it's not probably about like the shop that you could probably uh, find some photos of, but it was like we just sold Sadio parts and grind parts and like people would come to get their flats fixed and we're like we don't do that we're not that type of bike shop. Like, <laughs> and like we just refused to work on anyone's bike and it was just like a messenger hangout uh type vibe and then i like lived in the shop but uh it like for like a, a month or so uh in the winter but like you can't close like those like roll down gates like from the inside so i had to like close it from the inside and then like like hammer this like wrench into a hole <laughs> Um, but every time I'm like asleep, I'm like someone could like break in and just like lift up this gate. But the wrench would have like made a really loud bang and like wake me up, and it would like have jostled it if like they tried to get in. So I just like slept with like a like a baseball bat next to me, and I just like lived in the shop. <laughs> That's crazy. So, all right. That Fuck yeah, you, dude. That grime that grime location always seemed like like how are you making money and able to sustain that place? Well, we were doing a lot of all online sales. So that was just like where we kept product. And then every day we were just going to USPS dropping orders. Um, we were selling a lot of t-shirts back then. A lot of like, yeah, I cool. mean, we were the only one selling Saudio at the time. And then we, I think we sold the rights of to I-D to sell Saudio for the US. So like Saudio ate off that and then like we ate off that too. So uh, it was cool. I like, I, I made a, like a profession off of fix here freestyle for a good many years it's rare i don't think a lot of people were doing that but it's yeah, probably like I a job it, like i that was my job it's probably also because you were in the back end of things not just riding like i don't know if there were anybody there was anybody just surviving off riding right probably not or like it's negligible you could say ed was on the back end of things um but he was surviving off riding he was making good money um um why did uh why did grime come to a actually before i talk about the end of grime let's talk about shredwell 2 a little bit um oh, it's the best it's my Shredwell 2, Shredwell Shredwell 2. Shredwell 2. <laughs> dude so many iconic tricks uh b-roll like dialogue lines in that that video such a such a masterpiece um how was your time how was your time filming for that oh it was the best like it was um we had like we made shredwell uh in new york and we had talked about shredwell too as if it was something we were filming like immediately after and we like didn't (laughs) film for it for like a year or something or like a long time um, but we were just like telling people, right? Oh, just wait to shred well too. It, like, man, like it's it's coming. And uh, then it started to like catch up to people. Who were like, when the fuck is this video going to come out? So we're, like, we gotta we gotta take like a, t- a tour. We gotta go down to L.A. Because at the time, like, there was like almost like this like New York to L.A. beef. And so we we're like, we gotta go down there and like ride their spots and like show them like what like real street is. And um, it was great. I I loved making that. Uh, Matt Reyes had a huge part in the post production of that. Uh, that's why it looks nicer than Shredwell One. And uh, all filmed yeah, on DSLRs. Was, yep, all filmed on like a Canon Canon EOS, like 60D. Maybe 60D, uh, something like that, with the little fold out screen. I know that's what uh I know that's the camera Slum had at least. Yeah. Um, yeah then it was. Pretty much all 6CD. And then I, I had uh, like a Canon camcorder too. So there might there's some shots where like you get the little, little zoom. Uh, camcorder zoom and shit. 
Yeah, that's a nice that's a nice touch. But to maybe have. that camera actually came in for turf. To be honest, I think it, it's all. I think it's a, it is all sixty D footage for Shredwell too, and flip cam. We used the flip cam. Remember that? Krillswell. Yep, Krillswell is sick. <laughs> That was a cool video. Go look on Fixed Gear Archive for Krill's Well if you haven't seen it. Also, watch Shredwell 2 if you haven't seen it. It's pretty iconic. We re-uploaded it to the Fixed Gear Archive uh, because it's been taken down from ev- from so many places so many times. Yeah, it's like part of it is like the intro song uh, samples like Dio, this like r- old rock band. And like that is always like that audio is always just like cut. So you start the video and you hear no audio and then... Um, there was like a lot of uh, music rights uh, flops in my, uh, like all my Vimeo got taken down because of how many like flags I got for like using music that wasn't, I didn't have the rights to or whatever. You know, it's crazy. I think it's fully up in its like entirety on stay, like living on the archive channel right now. I haven't gotten any like muting notifications or anything. So that's pretty cool. Can't say the same about a lot of other videos though. Because yeah. YouTube is YouTube is weird with it. Sometimes they just don't like a certain song. It's like this song can't be in this, and then if this song is in a longer video, we're gonna just take down the whole thing. I dealt with a nightmare uh, with Can't Jewel the Youth. Oh yeah, I bet. Because I uploaded it all in its entirety, and then like two songs didn't play well with others, and then it just made the whole video un unseeable anywhere. So that sucked. But Shredwell two. That was such a sick video. Um, iconic, iconic everything, dude. And you had beef with SoCal. Uh, why was why was that the case? Who was it with? How did it get resolved? It was mostly with Silky. Uh, and I don't know why I called Matt Spencer Silky uh, or who <laughs> called him Silky. But um, it was like he was just like a like a troll on uh <laughs> track track and so i was like fuck this dude like i and uh now i like he's a great guy i love that guy uh but yeah i think it like he kind of fueled it and then like the whole like fixie factory uh was like kind of like just like they would just like say like mean stuff or like comment mean shit and so i was like i like, didn't like them because they were just like internet trolls where were these comments happening? Because from someone on the outside, I didn't really see any of it. I just knew there was beef. Yeah. I mean, even the whole, like, Congo making fun of me by saying you know what's good a million times. So it's like, that was like... Uh, <laughs> Is that... That's what he was doing? Give me the dish You know what's good. Yeah, it was because I said you know what's good in my bike check in Thailand. And so uh, he... The whole you know what's good thing was like him making fun of me. I did no. not know. I did not know that. Wait, wait. What about the, you know the what's wheel good? Deal, the wheel deal Holyfield. What about? Oh, he's making that? fun of Wonka. Oh, fun of oh, yeah. dude. Oh, and so like Congo and Silky would like just like clown on us all the time, and like uh, <laughs> Pissy never did, but he was like in that like. No, but sorry. Corey's name was Weezen Y for a reason. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's true. true. Hey, I'm really gonna expose Corey. <laughs> that's public knowledge. I asked him about this beef. I asked Corey about this beef. He doesn't even remember. Love that. He was like, "What? There was beef." <laughs> there was definitely beef, but it was okay. Yeah, I remember seeing little comments here and there, and like maybe threads. Like a picture would get posted, and then someone would be like, "I think." I think I remember one specifically where Matt posted a picture of himself like in Austin or in Texas doing some gap. And then it might have been you or someone else affiliated with you was like, there's no way that's a five foot tree gap or something like that. <laughs> like, yeah, like they like had some like caption on it being like, like five foot drop. And I'm like, if you look at the shadow, I'm like, calling like, oh, my God, dude. <laughs> You know what's good was because it was, fuck that's hilarious. Because yeah, I said it about the peanut butter sidewall, and I was like, "Oh, if you you know it's good. Like this is the best tire." <laughs> and uh, the Congo then just was like, "I'm going to use this and like uh, make fun of Mike Schmidt." I iconic <laughs> on both ends though. You yeah. you saying you know what's good that's iconic, and then Congo saying it also equally separately iconic. <laughs> 
I'm pretty sure that was on shirts and shit. <laughs> yeah. And this, I think 700C Don't Limit Me was a, like shots fired at like me trying to convert the whole scene to 26. Yeah, yeah, they they were about the 700C life, and then Congo was the first one to switch over. Yeah. Then everyone was like, ah, oh, shit, here it comes, and then everyone switched. Yeah, and you were, like, one of the stragglers. I was one of the last ones. Yeah. Uh, Corey is the only one who beat me out. Maybe maybe Mike Chacon, too, if he counts. Yeah. <laughs> uh <sighs> I had something I was going to say about all of that, um, but it's oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> fleeting my mind. But what I do want to talk about is Mike's knee. Oh, dude. Uh-huh. What the hell happened to your knee? What's wrong? Is it still messed up? What happened to it? Talk about so, Fahate. Fahate <laughs> was like a fixed gear event that was like a tr- track crit and a uh, trick comp. And it was in San Juan, Puerto Rico, and they flew like, uh, like the whole grime team uh, out, and then like we also brought Lucas um, along to just like, cause he his mom used to like work for like Delta Airlines, and he could just get free flights. Yo, so, like, Lucas, come through. Uh, you could just like sleep on the couch. Shout out Rat Pack. Yeah, hell yeah, Rat Pack fixed. And um, I had like I was living in California at the time, but I had gone to New York for Krills's wedding. And they bought me a ticket from New York, like to Fajate, and they bought me a ticket back to New York. And I was like, "Dude, like, I don't live in New York. I live in California. Like, can you buy me a ticket to California?" And they're like, "No, like, that's the <laughs> ticket we got for you." So I was like, "Fuck it, I'm just gonna live in Puerto Rico." Um, and while we were film, like, filming the trick comp, I like hit a rock and I scraped my knee a little bit, uh, barely, and it was fine. It was like. Uh, just like a, a scab and everyone left uh, like the the trip was over and I decided to just live in Puerto Rico and um, just like ride the grime ghost and I like was waiting on some money like I minus D was like notoriously really late for like sending us um, like, like like net 30 purchase orders for uh, grime frames and so I was like running really low on money and I was like I'm gonna start like just climbing a palm tree and like get a coconut from the tree and like i'll just like that will be like part of like how i just survive out oh here. my god where were you and where were you li- like sleeping they had uh there's a bike shop so called ciclo cannibal so like a bike cannibal and uh the bike shop owned like it was like this like couple uh that was together and the girl had like an apartment that like she had moved in with the the owner and so they were using her apartment as like storage so they were like, hey, if you like come to the bike shop and like help out, like you can just stay for free um, and like live here in like San Juan. And so um, I was like just living out there doing my thing. And one time when I was like climbing the palm tree to get a coconut, I like scraped my knee and then I swam in the ocean uh, and then like went on some like like date with some like girl from like some dating app. But like this is like. 2012 dating app so it was like wild, wild uh, <laughs> times. only real ones and, were on there yeah i remember like i woke up and i was like oh my god like my knee had turned to the size of a coconut and like the photo of me waking up like it's on at mike's knee um you can if you go to the very bottom and like it is like the whole chronological story up until the last post which is a shredwell 2 ad uh, but, <laughs> is that a, is that an instagram account yeah at yeah. mike's knee yeah i still think i still follow that dude i think follow it <laughs> I've lost a lot of followers. I think there's only like 30 followers left, but um, I don't have the password to it, so <laughs> I can't update it. But I also had Mike's thumb uh, at Mike's thumb, um, <laughs> but that one got taken down because it was like too gross for Instagram, I guess. Wow. It's it's honestly looking at it, and I, I have it up right now because yeah, I still follow it. A lot of that I feel like shouldn't be on Instagram. Like there's three photos I feel like just shouldn't be on Instagram that's still there. But I feel like this was so like in the early comings of Instagram there was like no filter. Yeah. There's literally like a, oh, your god. knees open. Oh god. Your knees open. Yeah. Like that should not be on Instagram. Like, act up and like the wound vacuum was like leaking like green oh, pus and shit. Oh god. <laughs> So, no. I forgot. So, about, like I've seen these pictures, but every time it really just oh, 
Yeah, I remember seeing. I remember seeing like the first. And it, okay, no, real quick, what is okay? Is this like the mass that was in your knee? Uh oh, the piece that's taken out. That's my bursa. So my knee bursa was removed. Ah, uh, it got like infected this. with staph infection. <laughs> I don't like Dude. this. I'm, I regret bringing up Mike's knee. Oh, God. I need That's to get sick. it away. That's sick. Okay, next. Uh, I, <laughs> I remember. So uh, are, you still, are you still affected by that? Uh, yeah. Like, I have, like, a Baker cyst because of it, because I have bad circulation in my knee. Uh, I don't have a bursa in my left knee, so, like, my skin is healed to the kneecap, uh, which is, like, kind of weird. So it's, like, it opens up like a fucking... <sighs> like tin can if i hit it because there's just like no blood flow uh and it's like the skin is like healed to the cap so it's like not uh like it doesn't like it's like i don't know it's whatever happened to it it's uh if i like bump into something my knee just opens up it's like once you once you break it open it's never the same yeah uh, so even like last summer i i crashed while filming a clip of matt reyes and i open up my knee again that sucks you've had yeah. you've had seemingly like some of the worst like consistent injury problems um like your shoulder too right yeah so the shoulder started in 2015 uh on a trip to albuquerque with uh like matt spencer and elliot and ian walker oh and, yeah um there's like this rail that goes down and then flat it's like a blue rail um and oh jackson was on the trip and some of the foe dudes and like i did i crooked the rail like like down and through the kink and landed it and like jackson was like dude i like missed the clip <laughs> like, i'm like what like how did you miss that clip so i went to go do it again and like it, the rail was like in the middle of the steps but then there's like a rail on other the either side and I like somehow just like fell over and went to grab the other rail and it like ripped my arm out of the socket and then I fell like on the spot where your shoulder's supposed to be but it was like disconnected um and I didn't go to the hospital I just like popped it back in and uh my shoulder dislocates 1 to 6 times a month currently I've had two surgeries on it hey, so the surgery what did the surgeries even do Nothing. Um, oh, the up. surgeries were arthroscopic, so like small little cameras going in and like uh, suturing uh, ligaments, but ligament can't heal the bone. Ligament can only heal the scar tissue, so it didn't really work. And so I need to get another surgery that's like a full open surgery, like a, maybe like a five inch incision where they do a bone graft. Uh, but that's just like not something I like. I'm excited to do, so I've been putting it off. But I had a surgery in like 2018 and in 2020. Are you going to make Jackson pay for it? <laughs> no, but he doesn't even have the clip of me falling. So not only did he not get the clip of me landing it, Jackson. but then he's like, dude, I, I must have deleted the card of you like falling. So I have no... There's a photo, though. There is a photo of me crooking the rail. Uh, it was like we lit it up at night and stuff. Um, I've probably uh, seen it. Wolf it's on uh, Wolf Drawn Tumblr, I think. Uh, like me doing crooked down and flat i'll try to pull that one up for for viewers nice uh we we have to wrap up uh shortly but i yeah, wanted I to get into you. grime disbanding real quick what happened to the grime i think you know maybe people internally know but i don't think i think it was a kind of a mystery to everybody uh externally yeah uh it was like we all were kind of going our different ways ed wanted to make more uh money for himself krills wanted uh krills was like keeping a lot of uh like he was like in charge of the money but some of the money was had gone missing um for whatever uh reasons uh, i i don't want to like talk shit about krills because he was such a pivotal part uh in making grime happen but some of the money probably like turned into beers uh and maybe by some, it's a lot. But, uh, and I just wanted to make a cool brand still. And, like, we all wanted different things out of the grind. We all couldn't agree on, like, how to work while I, me and Ed were living in the Bay and Krills was living in New York and he didn't want to ever move to the uh, to San Francisco. So uh, we kind of just decided, like, 
like we were done and we were going to just like dissolve the business license but i owned the logins for like the vimeo and the instagram so as soon as we like dissolved it i just already had like um like a new brand in mind i was like it's called turf i had the logo done and i just like seamlessly changed it and just like started telling people I'm like this is grimes now turf let's and go and so uh at the time i think ed thought he was like a co-owner but he invested nothing and so i uh gate kept it for myself how yeah. did um what's what's the the lore for turf i know you have you know lore for the grime is um her name um what's the what's turf like you uh you explore your neighborhood and like by riding street and like we i liked the that it still felt like i had an edge to it it's like get the fuck off my turf but also like the coolest part about riding is not skate park riding it's like like roaming through neighborhoods and just like sometimes those neighborhoods are not the nicest or the most affluent and just like finding the joy of like uh architecture that can be played on nice turf and then that led into word is bond we know we all know and love word is bond amazing bike video iconic sections you finally were able to tur put matt reyes onto the team which was yep. great i'm sure signature part it was also one of the first videos that we created that was all sections like uh like all profiles i i was really big on montage uh videos because i felt like it, it was better for uh like getting people excited to ride like to see a mix of things but for turf i was like this everyone should have like a their own feature and then some people had like a mix section like jd and, and hambone and um oh wow the actual part the ham bones Wow. So yeah, we uh, made that bar end. I saw that a mountain bike company deity had a bar end that looked identical. And I was like, if you just drill a hole in this, like you could smoke weed out of this. So uh, <laughs> that's, that's what I made. Let's go. Did everybody have a signature, a plan signature part? Uh, a plan. Yeah. Like, uh, like Jimmy Watcha had like uh, cranks and a sprocket. Uh, I had pegs. There was plans for, um, there was like a chain tool that was like, uh, like it was like a, a open ended 17 wrench and like a chain breaker that we made. There was, um, I mean, M R Matt obviously had the stem, the slingshot for Matt Reyes. What was Ed's going to be? I don't, oh, the hub. Mm. <laughs> I made a hub for a while. I made like a, like 14 mil female um hub that it would have worked if i had maybe like 10 more grand but i like sunk like seven grand into the hub and i just like couldn't <sighs> get lie. it dialed enough did you see that somebody <laughs> on who we're gonna leave unnamed was selling all of the turf products on ebay <laughs> yeah uh <sighs> fuck that rapist but uh next question uh, <laughs> Oh man, um, <clears throat> we're we're wrapping up here. Um, I know I said that already, but I want to know the. We're kind of we've gone to final questions, boys. Uh, I want to know which of your video sections, your personal ones that involve your writing, that you are the most proud of. I like Chain Gang. I think, uh, and that's a, another montage video because I felt like uh, the montage was like needed at that time and uh it was just like a very fond memory of like uh holding an event and like making everyone show up to like arizona and uh that was fun like just knowing that like it was all just like it, it wasn't no one was filming for our video like nobody knew i was making chain gang like i knew i was and i knew like i had like 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 designed out like title cards and stuff like that i knew uh the songs and like how like one song would sample like the next song uh and i like had this whole plan but everyone was just casually riding because like that was the downtime uh for prickly pear jam uh which was like a, yeah. an event i held in a ditch and so <laughs> i just think like the it's a fond memory uh i i think my fall off section is my favorite like solo part where does bond edit is pretty cool too Twilight Zona. 
<clears throat> Twilight Princess, uh, that's also cool because I was just like, I felt like I had something to like prove to be like, look, I'm still here. I like, I still ride. And so good. Uh, it was like casual riding, but like harder riding with Twilight Zone. Dude, and you had Who is Mike Schmidt, man? How do you? There's too many. There's too many. There's all, they were all iconic, dude. Thank you. The Who's Mike Schmidt, there's like some weird tricks in there. Like I like grind like this flat bar with like a 20 foot drop on the side of it and like the intro. And I'm like, why did I do that? Like <laughs> it was like above a pool uh, in like a college in Oakland. Yeah. You, they, I don't know, all your, all your writing and all your, all your edits have had such like some of the most unique writing ever. <clears throat> you have, you have a, take on spots that's just i don't know it's, I, it's time it's a uh, timeless appreciate that um boys if you have any last questions that you would like to ask mike i would ask them now as i have to leave for work very shortly mike what's the greatest sandwich of all time <laughs> oh um uh, like like any uh spicy vegan fried chicken sandwich is the best sandwich you can get uh, <laughs> okay. but there's a place called clementine bakery in brooklyn that uh really does it does it good nice uh, hey, yes, also yes. mike also mike we'll end on this bombshell what happened to my crook <laughs> where's the fish angle of my crook i can look for it um <laughs> But I think I, I think it's not. It's just it's just it's, it's, it's under it's under the desk. It's, it's it might be in one of these, but I'll I'll have to take a look. Uh, I think it's gone forever. Yeah, it's oh, just shit. ethered. It's probably better that it's ethered. Yeah, that was gonna that was gonna be a goob angle of that crook man. Yeah, sorry about that. No, it's cool. It's okay. I was just hyped that you were there that day. It's because. You knew that we, you knew that we were friends with Jackson, and you were just paying it back that for Jackson losing your clips to us. You're yeah. just pay, paying it forward. For sure. Um, we need some. We need some inspirational talk for pizza. You you gotta you gotta tell him not to be scared. You gotta tell him to throw his pegs on stuff. You gotta hype him up so he gets gnarly. Yeah, pizza. Um, believe in yourself. All right, sick. Um, monster truck Thank. through life. <laughs> it's through so life. Crazy. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try. Okay. I'll try for you. And never rebrand. Pizza Main is uh, until death. Yeah, Got it's it. so Thank good. <laughs> we we have to we have to end this with a current life update, Mike. Where are you now? Are you still riding? Are you going to start riding? And what is that product that you've been talking to us about? Uh, I do ride. I don't ride often. Um, pretty much every time I ride the fix your freestyle bike, my shoulder dislocates. Um, so I don't ride super often, but I, I do occasionally, uh, I, I ride like the 700 C mash frame. Shout out to mash. Shout out to Mike Martin. Um, uh, and so I ride that maybe more. So it's behind me, but it's not assembled, but that's like the slumworm frame. And then you can see some like, uh, H plus on Phil Woods. Here. We, we've come full circle. Mike is on 700 C again. Yeah, limiting myself uh, for sure. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I like won a competition like two like a year and a half ago in New York. Uh, that I, so like I still ride. Uh, I I did I won with like a bar to feeble on the blubba like the big blob hubba that I did ten years <laughs> earlier. I didn't say a pick, but uh, <laughs> yeah, like I still ride. I just. Uh, I like went through some like weird life things and uh, then like moved to India for six months and now I'm back in New York living in Brooklyn. I'm in Clinton Hill. It's like a, a nice, charming neighborhood. And I, I do uh, essentially exactly what I did for turf and grime. I just do it for a different brand um, as like a job or career. Amazing, man. Cool, man. Pizza, any last questions? Um, I have one. I don't know if it's uh, it was appropriate for I don't know. I was gonna ask when's the last time you talked to Ed or if there's any 
connection to Ed still or you I, know, cause I he's... should reach out. Uh, I haven't reached out since moving back this January. Um, so like four or five weeks ago. Um, but I, I searched for Ed and like even contacted his like brother. Uh, it, he was, I couldn't connect with him. Uh, it, it was like, I wasn't sure if he was like in jail or if he had died or if he was just like hanging out with, uh, his girl Jessica and I like couldn't connect with him. And then last spring, like right as I like the week I was leaving New York to move to India, uh, he reached out and he was like, "What? You live in New York and you're not gonna say what's up?" And I was like, "You're allowed." Like, I was like, "Dude, I'm leaving. I'm like moving to the fucking like Far East." Uh, and he was just like, "Oh shit, okay." Um, and then, then I haven't heard from him since. But he's alive. He's uh, I don't know what he's doing, but he's. He's, he's alive. Yeah, that's yeah. good to that's know. Good. That's, that's good. good. That's I think that's, all of our worst one, fear. Yeah, it was one of the one oh. of the mysteries we've always uh, talked about. So, and I owe a lot of things to Ed. Like Ed, really, uh, without him putting me on to Gorilla uh, or or Chari and Co. Or without him like putting his life at risk to for the crime, like this podcast might not be here so thank you ed if you're listening to this i doubt it but uh, shout out uh shout out ed wonka um mike want to take us out with uh the new product that you are you've been teasing us or do you want to keep that under wraps oh yeah i can say uh right now uh i'm just like working on something it will probably be small batch and it'll probably be more of like a boutique part it it's not necessarily a uh, fix your freestyle base. It's more of like a 700 C track base because it will be a uh, stem. Uh, it's reminiscent of a slingshot, but it's uh, kind of like a, a new version of what that could be. Uh, it'll be like 31.8 uh, bar clamp and uh, it might never come out but it might come out right now uh we're working on some 3d modeling we have some preliminary sketches we'll 3d print it make like a rapid plastic uh prototype and then i'm speaking with uh like i have a a connect to make it in the u.s if i want to but i'm also speaking with mash uh about uh going through one of their uh like taiwanese factories and uh yeah i probably will make a limited amount i think even like I want to laser like one out of 20 or one out of like 30 on each one. So so like, you know, like, Oh, like I got like the 30th one. Um, and it like, I don't, I'm not doing it necessarily to make money because if you're only making 20 or 30 stems, like you're spending an arm and a leg, but I just like want to make something again for the scene. And just like, I want to make a shape that is unique. Like uh, there's a million stems. You can go buy a, if it's like for you could buy a Thompson stem that's probably going to be way more reliable and lightweight, but like we all know what that looks like, and I want to make just something that just is aesthetically interesting. So um, there's plans for that. Who knows uh, if they'll fruit? But um, Mike, yeah, when you make it, it, when you make it, can you make my number sixty nine? Even if you don't make sixty nine. <laughs> Probably not, but um, <laughs> but I'll give you I'll give you a uh, friends and family discount. Sixty nine no, cool. out of thirty. Yeah, yeah. sixty nine <laughs> out of thirty. Uh, or six out of nine. Maybe I only make nine, and you can get the sixth one. Ooh, that's fine. <laughs> Let's go. <laughs> oh, or wait, no. What's more, you get twenty, and you get the fourth one. For the lore. For, for the lore. Actually, I don't think I deserve that one. <sighs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, Mike Schmidt, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. It's it's Thanks that time to me. wrap up. I feel like there were we could have gone for another three hours. There's infinite things to talk about with you. Uh, a man of many talents. Uh, a man with so much like such a deep, rich history in fixed gear freestyle. And we're all honored by your presence. And we're all very happy that you still pay attention to the scene. There's a lot of people from, from the OG days who kind of fell off, haven't, you know, heard from them in a minute, but we're very happy that you're still here and trying to ride occasionally. Thank you for coming on. Thank you all for your time. Oh, of course. Thank you, sir. No, thank you, sir. And if you're listening to this, 
Thank you for listening. Uh, make sure to like, subscribe, comment, uh, all the above. We have a bonus episode that we're going to be doing in our Patreon. Not with Mike, unfortunately, but we'll be. it'll be us three goons just talking about who knows what yet. Uh, thanks for listening, and we'll catch you guys in the next episode. Don't forget to check out the Patreon. Get the yes, cool new right. stickers that Mike made. Those ones right there. Mike's design. Mike's design. Yeah, subscribe like me.